Hello everyone. In the last lecture towards the end, we saw a few straightforward examples of divisibility wherein we noticed that if we put certain conditions on the remainder, then we get a unique quotient and a unique remainder. And in today's lecture, we are going to formalize these ideas in the form of the statement of the division algorithm. So in this lecture, I will be stating the division algorithm. And we'll of course not be proving it because this is just a preliminary chapter. And you have already covered this in the first year algebra. But this is going to be of extreme importance to us in group theory as well as the follow-up course in the next semester that is ring theory. So it is very important to once again look at this statement. From there on we will move to the definition of divisibility and then we will look at properties of divisibility. So uh, let's come to the statement of the division algorithm. It says that for any two integers a and b if I wish to divide a by b, firstly b should not be equal to 0. So whatever number we are going to divide with, that should be non-zero. Then division algorithm says that there is a method of dividing by which you will get a quotient and a remainder. Moreover, if you put these two conditions on the remainder, then the, quotient, then the remainder becomes unique and consequently, the quotient also becomes unique. So, what are the two conditions on the remainder? Let's quickly recall. The remainder has to be non-negative. Now, non-negative means it has to be either positive or zero. And it has to be smaller than the number that we are dividing with in some sense. Now, I'm, you, I'm saying some sense because if b is not equal to zero, then b can be either a positive integer or a negative integer. And if r is not going to be negative and if b happens to be negative, there is no way you can say directly r is smaller than b. So we look at modulus of b. Because irrespective of whether b is positive or negative, modulus of b is going to be a positive number. And therefore it would be okay to say that r is smaller than modulus of b. So, if I put these two conditions on the remainder, then we saw in all those earlier examples that the remainder becomes unique and consequently the quotient also becomes unique. And moreover, you can write A as B times the quotient plus the remainder. Now, in all this, the number which is undergoing division is called the dividend. The number which will, which will divide is called the divisor. Q is the quotient. And R is called as the remainder. Now I said R is non-negative. That means R is positive or equal to 0. So there are also possibilities. I mean obviously there are many examples wherein R is equal to 0. One such example is if you divide 35 by 5. You will get the quotient as 7 and the remainder as 0. So, re remainder equal to 0 is very much possible and in the above, uh, notice that if the remainder is equal to 0, I am going to get something like A equal to B times Q plus 0. In other words, A is equal to B times Q. One important point to keep in mind here is that Q is an integer. So, if the remainder is equal to 0, I get A as B multiplied by another integer or I say that A is a multiple of B. So if the remainder is 0 then A works out to be B times an integer. So we also say that A is a multiple of B or A is divisible by B. Or we can say that B is a factor of A. Or we say that B divides A. They all mean one and the same thing. 
So when I divide a by b, if I get the remainder as zero, I'm going to get a as an integral multiple of b, b times an integer. And you can say the same thing as a is a multiple of b, a is divisible by b, b is a factor of a, or b divides a. And this is the notation that we use to indicate that b divides a. Please recall from your first year algebra class that this is just a vertical bar. It's not a slash. So uh, when, you, when you use this notation, it is to be read from the left to the right. And you read it this way. B divides A or A is a multiple of B. So when I say B divides A, A is a multiple of B. So second number is a multiple of B and that multiple has to be an integer. So this is the definition of divisibility in the set of integers. We will now look at some properties of divisibility. I'll split the properties into two sets. Uh, I'll talk about some very uh, simple properties first. THM is short form for theorem. So as the first property of divisibility, let me mention that every non-zero integer divides zero. Now, when I read from left to right, it means A divides 0. Okay. Uh, I had mentioned earlier that 0 cannot be a divisor. 0 can never be a divisor. But it will all, it, it can be a dividend. In fact, every non-zero integer will divide 0. If you really want to look at the proof of it, see how the definition of divisibility goes. When I say A divides 0, it's the second number which has to be a multiple of the first. So I should be able to write the second number as the first number multiplied by some integer. And it's not very difficult to guess what that integer is going to be. You can always write 0 as a into 0. Also, if you take any integer a, you can write it as a into 1. So if we take any integer a, we can write it as an integral multiple of 1. So I can say that 1 divides A. I can also say that A can be written as minus A into minus 1. If A is an integer, minus A is also going to be an integer. So not only does 1 divide A, minus 1 also divides A. And from the same equations, we can also conclude that A will divide A and minus A will also divide A. So this property will be true for every non-zero integer. So that means for an integer A, 1 will always be a divisor, minus 1 will always be a divisor, a will be a divisor, so will minus a. So for an integer a, 1 minus 1, a and minus a will always be divisors. So there is nothing very great about these divisors. So these divisors are called as improper divisors of a. So 1 minus 1, A and minus A are called as improper divisors of A. Any divisor of A other than these will be called a proper divisor. So if you look at 6 for instance, then the improper divisors of 6 are 1, minus 1, 6 and minus 6. These are the improper divisors of 6. 
Does six have any proper divisors? Yes, it does. Two divide six. In fact, minus two also divide six. Three divide six. Minus three also divide six. So these are the proper divisors of six. Let's look at five. What are the improper divisors of five? One minus one plus five and minus five. These are the improper divisors of five. Think about what are the proper divisors of five. Right, five does not have any proper divisors. So the integer five. Does not have proper divisors. So you will notice that actually integers fall into two categories. There are integers which have proper divisors, and there are integers which do not have proper divisors. So we classify integers accordingly as primes, and composite numbers. The integers which do not have proper divisors are called as prime numbers and the integers which have proper divisors are called as composites. Please keep in mind that one is an exception, one as well as minus one. So one is neither a prime nor a composite. Now it's very clear why one is not a composite, obviously because it has no proper divisors. It may not be very clear why we do not take one as a prime. But somewhere at the end of this year, I'm not saying semester, at the end of this year when you do ring theory, you will realize why one is not considered as a prime. So for the moment just keep in mind that one is neither a prime nor a composite. So if I were to list the first few primes, the first few positive primes, then it's 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13 and so on. Again another interesting fact, not so interesting but uh, worth noting is that 2 is the only even prime number. All other prime numbers are of course odd because you take any other number uh, after 2, it's going to be uh, I mean any other even number after 2, it is going to be a multiple of 2. So, uh, these are some very elementary properties of divisibility. In the next lecture, we will start with a, uh, listing a few more properties of divisibility. And then we will move on to the concept of GCD of 2 integers. Thank you.